And uh, I believe that God is in the house, and I believe that God wants to touch us and minister to us. But there's just a few things that I want to share this morning uh, briefly, if I can. Um, it is very, very important for us in the hour that we're living in to know our enemy. Do you believe that today? And you know, sometimes we as Christians run around like with our head in the sand and, and uh, sort of think that everything's just going to be all right when around about us this world is crumbling. It's affecting our families. It's affecting loved ones. It's affecting people. And so I believe that you've got to know your enemy. In war, you must know your enemy's strengths. You've got to know its weaknesses. You've got to know that the power that God has invested in that name, which is above every name, that is Satan's greatest weakness. Satan's weakness is that he doesn't understand the power, really, that we have. But when we rise up, I believe that he's going to get the shock of his life. In sport, in war, in life, I don't believe there's much difference. You're playing a game of footy or whatever it might be, you've got to know your weak, the enemy's weakness or the other team's weaknesses. As soon as they see somebody that's hurt, somebody that's down, somehow or other in their mind, they calculate it and they know that there's going to be a hole there. And that's where they go through. There's somebody there that can't catch the ball, guess who they kick it to every time? Trying to find that weak spot because it's no good... Uh, passing it to the strong guy. So I, I believe that uh, in everything that we do, we've got to know our enemy. T TV advertising, they know the weaknesses of our flesh. <laughs> See something on telly? I don't know. How many people here have ever seen something advertised on telly and the person at the other on the television is, is eating this thing and, 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 and all of a sudden, all the juices inside just start going off. Anybody else like that, or is it just me? Come and tell the truth and shame the devil. Amen? And, and, you, and something inside you says, you just got to get one of those. You just got to have one of those. It doesn't matter if you're trying to lose weight. It doesn't matter. You just see that oozing down. You just got to have one of those things. And nine times out of ten, when you eventually get one, it doesn't taste the same as the one that the guy had on television. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. You go into a shopping center and you come home with something you never intended to buy or most probably you can't even afford. I believe that what I want to share this morning, I'm talking about the world, the flesh and the devil. In Romans 7, 22, 23, it says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. You've got to know your enemy today. You've got to understand him. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And I believe that Paul had a revelation, and the more you read his writings and things like that, he speaks so much about the flesh. He speaks so much about the weaknesses in, our, in ourselves. We have to understand that in reality, there's an outward and there's an inward. And when we come to terms with this, it's not mystical. It's not some sort of hocus-pocus thing. It's, it's not something like that, but it's a reality. We've got an inward and we've got an outward. The, uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The outward man is perishing. This is the aging progress, process. Anybody ever notice that you're sort of changing a little bit? But that's something that you cannot stop. I want to tell you there's no, there's no fountain of youth. There's no pill, I'm sorry, on that at the end of the road there, that can actually restore your youth and make you young again. 
It doesn't matter whether they freeze your body. It doesn't matter what they do with you. There's nothing that can stop this aging pro process because at the fall of man, our bodies were condemned. Death reigned in our bodies. Therefore, therefore though we do, do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet there's an inward man. Our inward man is being renewed day by day. Outward man is perishing. This is the aging progress process. Why? So originally our bodies were created to live forever. Science will tell us that we've got things inside us that, that keep reproducing. And, and that process is still happening to a degree to keep us alive for the years that God has allotted to us. There's something there that's going on and there's parts of me that's being renewed, but it's not a permanent thing. It's something there that won't last forever. Our bodies were created that, but because of the fall in the Garden of Eden, the flesh man was judged and condemned to death. That's why we've got to get born again. In Romans 5, and I want to go just read some stuff, and the communion was all about this, really. It says there, and it says, through one man's offense, death reigned. Death reigned through one man's offense. It's, I, I want to just read some scriptures to you. Let's have a look at the book of Romans. I was trying to do this in a bit of a hurry, but I don't think I should. It's going to take a little bit of time. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, we've got a little bit of time in this place. It says in Romans 5, it says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin. If we've got to understand that. Through Adam's offense, death came into the world. Death came into our mortal bodies. Something happened to humanity. Therefore, just as through one man's sin, uh, through one man's sin, okay. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men because all men sin. You believe that today? Verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. We've got to understand this, that our mortal bodies, our flesh man, has already died. There's an outward man that is perishing, that has 120 or 70, whatever you want to believe, years on this planet. But there's an inward man that is being renewed day by day that's going to live forever and ever and ever. The Word of God says, Jesus speaking, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, Yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me will never die. See, there's a part of you and me, if we're born again of the Spirit of God, will never die. But there's a part of humanity, if they're not born again of the Spirit of God, they will die. They will not live forever and ever as you and I will live. Those of us that know Jesus. Death reigned from Adam. And then it says in verse 17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace. How many people are thankful for the grace of God? And of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one, one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, one man's righteous act, the free gift, came to all men, resulting in justification of life. It goes on. You need to read this and understand it. Through one man's offense, death reigned. So now the Word of God says we must be born again, born of the Spirit, through the cross of Calvary. That's when the inner, inward man, the Bible says, the candle of our life, of our heart, is lit. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ, I believe, is one of the most profound and the most amazing things that could ever happen. But unfortunately, it, could, it went through life and not too many people even understood it was going on. Because you see, it's not done out in the open. There was something that was done in the realm of the Spirit. There was something that was done in the heavenlies. There was something that was done in the Spirit world that smashed and destroyed everything, every plan of the devil in reality. But you and I, because we can't naturally see it with our natural eyes, we have to, it has to be spiritually discerned. You have to read your words. You've got to get an understanding of this amazing feat that God did, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There has never been a day, and there never most surely will be until Jesus comes back, a day like that. Amen. What an amazing day in the realm of the Spirit. I want to say this, it was like all hell broke loose. Something happened in the realm of the Spirit. Mankind, who had been held captive through the fall of man, is now free. If we, the church, understood that Jesus' redemption has freed us, we are to be free. We're not to, we're not to go around like some religious thing, but to be free. In freedom, He has saved us. In freedom, He wants us to express the love of God. We don't have to go and tell people to go into hell. People don't care. You've got to tell people about the goodness of God. Amen. You've got to talk about the joy of your salvation. Talk about the, the wonderful thing. You can't frighten people into, into heaven. I found that anyhow. It might last for a little while, but it won't last for long. Mankind have been held captive at the fall of man is now free. Jesus, the Bible says, led captivity captive. I believe today we have a, a, a mini uh, reactment react of this event every time somebody is born again. When people are born again, they're born out of death into life. They've come out of death into life, and there's, there's a mini reaction of that. And for some people, they don't understand, but, but they, they look at you and they say, I don't know, but there's something going on. I, I just feel different. There. Anybody ever experienced anything like that? I was talking to Gordon the other night. I was talking about, about allowing God to feel God. and, to, to, and allow, Man, I can feel it even now. As soon as you start talking in the realm of the Spirit, God comes down. And we're just sitting in, on a couple of chairs just talking, and, and there were things going on around us. But, but as we talked, I said, I can sense it. He said, I can sense it. You see, we are not natural. We are supernatural people. We're not, born, we're not of this world, we're of another world, of another dominion. And it might sound hocus pocus and it might sound strange, but that's the reality of it. Until we have a mind shift and understand that, we'll stay carnal. We've got to become spiritual. We've got to come and understand the spirit world. There's a part of me that's aging and a part of me that's being uh, renewed. There's a part of me that's being changed. Your flesh can't change. Can I say this? Your flesh will never change. You cannot rehabilitate your flesh. It has to be crucified. You can't, cannot make it look good. You can't make it change. Because it's, 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 that's it. It will destroy you if it can. Your flesh can't change. The greatest enemy of your spiritual development. How many people were, were listening to the prophetic word saying, get rid of the stumbling blocks and get rid of this and get rid of that and so, so that you can come into something? And there's not one person here today that doesn't want to develop in the realm of the spirit. But you see, your greatest enemy of your spiritual development is not the devil. It's your own flesh. Your own flesh does not want to serve God. And it never will. 
The Bible says there is therefore, therefore now no condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Most decisions we make that affect our spiritual walk come out of our flesh. Most decisions, listen to this, this is very, very important. Most decisions that we make that affect our spiritual walk come from our flesh. Oh, I love the church and the vision, but it's a little too far. Oh, I like this, but that. And it comes out of the flesh. It comes out of our thinking. It comes out of what we think. Your flesh is not interested in your children, in your children's spiritual growth. It's only interested in pleasing itself. It's not interested in your spiritual growth. People have to make decisions. Why? What would be best? And most of those decisions come out of our flesh thinking, not out of the realm of the spirit. This morning I spoke a little bit about so many of these people that started in the church and ended up away. How did that happen? Friend, I want to tell you today, more than anything else, we have to get involved in the realm of the Spirit. We must allow the Spirit of God to get around us. The flesh is not interested in the welfare of you or your children. It's only interested in itself. I want to feel comfortable. Oh, man, I could go on all day. You know why? Because I wrote the book. The interesting thing is, you know what I'm talking about today and you know what I'm saying is right. Come on. Am I just talking to the floor? Our flesh will dominate you and control you. It will take you to hell if it can. Because it's not interested in the things of the Spirit. The unfortunate part about it is most of what it wants makes sense. Because your flesh will agree with it. The flesh has to be crucified. It's got to be crucified. Young men want to look like Rambo. I say, you can have a body like mine if you neglect it. (laughs) They build up their muscles. They shave their chests, even shave their legs these days. They go to the hairdresser. I'm surprised today that if I go to the hairdresser, I go to the barber, and he says, what do you want? I thought, how stupid can you be and still live? I want a haircut. Yeah, but what do you want? What do you mean, what do I want? Tell me, what do I want? So I found out now what I want, three up the side and over the top. But until then, I, I looked like, a, like an idiot. What do you I want a haircut. But, you know, today you see guys up there, they've got pins in them and sticking up, and they're going up here to shave this side, and they do a little bit there. And... They end up, they look like Tarzan. They smell like Jane, and they act like Cheetah. (laughs) Rock concerts and the drugs and the alcohol, the fights. What's going on? You see them the next day, they're all battered and bruised. You say, what, what, oh, I don't know, I can't remember a thing, but I must have had a good time. (laughs) I can't remember. 
You see, flesh is happy if it's got to have a good time. Consequences, the effects, the results, the outcome. That's what we've got to start to say. Hey, what is the consequence of the decision I'm going to make? What, what is the effect of the decision I'm going to make? What is the result of the out, what, what is the outcome and the result of what I'm doing? You know, today they, with the drugs and that, and it's true, they say that 80% of the kids that go to those rock things and goodness knows what, we've now got this other thing where the kids go, what do they call it, school, schoolies? Drugs and alcohol and stuff like that that's going on there. It must be horrible, you know, just for a parent to have kids going through that thing. They don't know what's going on. What's the effect? What's the result? Kids come home defiled, pregnant, perhaps an abortion, broken. We've got kids today, they say that the Sunshine Coast has the largest suicide rate amongst youth in any other place. Beautiful, beautiful Sunshine Coast. When we're dealing with the flesh nature, we must realize we're not dealing with a distant enemy. The enemy that we deal with goes with us everywhere we go. Spurgeon was in a, going back a long time, Spurgeon, but he was in a, was a speaker or overseeing a group of young men and women that were training to be ministry. And this young man stood up to preach and he was going to preach on the armor of God. Oh, he was so elegant, eloquent and everything else and his words were so powerful. He said, I get up of a morning and I put on the whole armor of God. Oh, I dress myself in the armor of God and I take the sword of the Spirit and I raise it in the air and I say, where are you now, devil? And Spurgeon, after everybody clapped and everybody did their thing and everything settled, Spurgeon had a chuckle. And he said, he's in the armor. <laughs> Wise old man, he's in the armor. You've got to realize you're not dealing with a distant enemy. This one goes everywhere you go and wants an opinion on every decision you make because he's within you. You know that January is almost finished. Eleven to go. Eleven to go. Just quickly. Keys to help overcome the flesh. Number one is consistency. I spoke about this the other week. Friend, we've got to be consistent in our prayer. Unfortunately, what we've got to understand, don't just come to God when you have a problem. Don't just pray a blessing over your meal. That's wonderful. I had one pastor tell me, he said, I pray over the uh, trolley when I'm coming out of the supermarket. That saves a lot of prayer. See, the flesh is smart. Flesh is very, very clever. Smarter than me. Consistency in prayer. I believe that prayer is really falling in love and expressing this through 
conversation. We made prayer a spiritual thing, but prayer is conversation. Prayer is falling in love and expressing love. Now, how long? How long, church, is it since you sat down in a chair somewhere and lifted up your heart and just told Jesus how much you really loved Him? Tell, tell Him how much you really, really appreciate Him. Tell Him how much you really, really, really want to please Him. Simply having a conversation with our God and friend. I don't want to sm make this sound disrespectful. But God isn't a God that doesn't want to have fellowship with us. I don't. He wants to come down. He wants to be with us. Amen. He wants to be our dad. He wants to be our friend. He's not just up in heaven looking down, wanting to pour out his fury and wrath. You might read about Sodom and Gomorrah and places like that, but I want to tell you for a couple of incidents like that, there's 99 or 100 places where God showed his mercy and his love and his grace. You've got to be consistent in Bible reading, reading the Word. You don't have to read the whole book. You know, I find that I used to try to read chapters and things like that, and I find out that after I read a two or four or five or six chapters of the book, I couldn't remember what I'd written, what I'd read. Better just to get a couple of verses and read them and and just look at them and study them a little bit and see what they mean. Look in the margin of your Bible and see what, what, what references and cross-references. Get it, get it, and, and start to get a few things. Start, start writing out a few sermons. Do something. Just get a Bible study going in your own heart. Soon we're going to start some uh, uh, Bible school. or Not Bible school. What do you call them? Whatever you call them. I don't know what you call them. <laughs> What do you call them? Home groups. <laughs> Praise God. Be constant and, and consistent in church attendance. Come to church. The Bible says, forsake not, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. I wonder why he said that. We say, and my flesh says, you can do it alone. <laughs> You can do it at home. You can do it watching Jimmy Swaggart. You can. You can do all those sort of things. But a coal taken out of the fire, I find, soon goes out. There's something about coming together. We need each other. Together we can do it. Know this, that the flesh knows the weaknesses. He's been with you a long time. Consistency, have a desire to please the lover of our soul. Can I, can I say this? I have found the greatest strength in my life to overcoming the flesh. And I can say, if I can say this, Nance mightn't even recognize it. <laughs> but the things in my flesh when things come, Paul said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I do want to do, I... No, whatever. The things I don't want to do, I do. And who knows what I'm talking about. When I slip, when, when I allow things to come in, you don't have to look so spiritual at me today thinking that, oh, I wouldn't allow that. Most of us are like the rest of us. That's Satan's greatest enemy. 
to you to think that you're the only one like it. We are flesh. And my flesh at times rises up. And my flesh desires things. Or this or that. Or my flesh causes me to react. But the greatest strength that I have found is in my relationship with Him that I can come and stand and, or sit or whatever it is before Him and say, Lord, I am sorry that I have offended you. I'm sorry. And that has been the strength in my life because I have got a desire. I don't always achieve it. I'm not always successful, but I have got a desire in my heart to please Him and Him only. Oh, I love you guys, and I'll do everything I can for you. I'll visit you, I'll do it in hospital or whatever I can do for you. But my strength is having a desire to please Him. I believe that's my greatest weapon against my flesh. I've got to put it down. Friend, forget about yesterday. Yesterday's victories. Yesterday's defeats. And focus on the now. This now is all you've got. And you know what? I found that God is just one breath away. I just want to please him. Anybody else here like that? And friends, when the music plays and the presence of God comes in, jump in. Let's not let our flesh try to control us. If you want to weep, weep. Especially Kevin this morning. As you shared from your heart. Desire in your heart. You know, that wasn't there, my shoddy, when he got up. Like the desire was there, but then as he started to speak it, as he started to, 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 to pray, and all of a sudden, that's when the Spirit of God gets inside you and around you starts to activate and motivate and all of a sudden it catches your emotions and, it, and all of a sudden you're, you're right in it. Now I believe that's where God wants to take us in worship. Not just shakabundi, whereas where we get swept away. We get taken into something so dynamic and so powerful. I am not talking mystical stuff. I'm talking where God wants us to go. Use those who would like to come, that would be great. All is swept away. When the music stops. You know what I find? I find many, many people, even as you might be witnessing the people on the street in the marketplace, when you start to speak to them about Jesus, I know that when the Holy Ghost gets on your life and you start to share the love of Jesus with somebody, there's not one person in this world that wouldn't want to accept that Jesus that loves them so much that he died for them. But I know that as you're talking to them and as God's starting to touch them, their flesh man rises up. 
And nine out of ten people resist, not because they want to, but because the flesh man has talked them out of it. I was reading a book that said most people need to hear the gospel at least seven times before they get born again. I don't totally agree with that. I just tell you what I believe is we need to get anointed. We need to have more passion. We're not going out to get scalps on a belt. We're going out dead to win souls for Jesus. Amen. I'd love us to sing that first song that we sang this morning. You knew that, didn't you? Can I tell you, guys, I appreciate you so much. Appreciate you guys so much. None of them is my daughter, so I can. <laughs> but I appreciate all of you. Rodney, thank you so much for the time you've given us. Thank you so much, Rodney. Thank you, guys. Let's stand. If you're in this house today, and I had a couple of words of knowledge, I felt there's somebody here, and you've got a sort of pain on this right-hand side of your head, and uh, there's somebody else with pain, it's in your lower, or higher back, up across your shoulders there, and um, somebody else here with a, a condition in your left shoulder, uh, if you're here like that, I'd love to pray with you. There's other people here that just need a touch from God or need something from God this morning. Just come out the front while we sing. And, uh, yeah. Somebody else here also, you've got a condition in your chest. Right across your chest there. Just in your chest. The power of God wants to touch you.